My name is Nina Patel, and you are watching the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference. Today's forum, Justice Innovation, Emerging Reforms in Criminal Justice and the Safe Justice Act, is hosted by Congressman Bobby Scott and generously sponsored by Warner Music Group. We will hear from the panel in a moment, but first, let me introduce our hosts. Congressman Robert C. Bobby Scott has represented Virginia's third congressional district in the United States House of Representatives since 1993. Prior to his service in Congress, he served 15 years in the Virginia General Assembly. Congressman Scott currently serves as the chairman of the Committee on Education and Labor. In this capacity, he is advancing an agenda that improves equity in education, frees students from the burdens of crippling debt, protects and expands access to affordable health care, ensures workers have a safe workplace where they can earn a living wage free from discrimination and guarantees seniors have a secure and dignified retirement. In 2015, he was one of the four primary authors of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which reauthorized the Elementary and Secondary Education Act for the first time in 13 years and replaced the No Child Left Behind Act. Congressman Scott also serves on the Committee on the Budget, where he is a leading voice on fiscal policy and reducing the deficit. As a former member of the Committee on the Judiciary, he is a leading advocate for reforming our nation's broken criminal justice system. He has successfully worked to pass bipartisan legislation to reduce mandatory minimum sentences, reform the juvenile justice system, and require reporting and federal data collection of deaths that occur in police custody, jails, and prisons. Congressman Scott resides in Newport News, Virginia. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Boston College of Law. He also served in the Massachusetts National Guard and the United States Army Reserve. It is my pleasure to introduce Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Nana, for your very kind introduction and good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for organizing the annual, the annual legislative conference and highlighting the important issues facing our community and country and convening these issue forums which bring together scholars, activists, and thought leaders in the field of criminal justice reform. As many of you know, I've long advocated for comprehensive reform of our criminal justice system. I've learned that when it comes to crime policy, you have a choice. You can reduce crime or you can play politics. The politics of so-called, politics of crime is so-called tough on crime policy, treats, um, uh, does things like treat juveniles as adults or enacting more mandatory minimum sentences, which can result in disproportionately long sentences. Under the get tough approach, no matter how tough you are, let, uh, no, under the get, get tough approach, no matter how tough you were last year, you have to be tougher this year. And we have been getting tougher year by year for over 25 years. Since 1980, we've gone from around 350,000 incarcerated individuals in the United States to 2.2 million. And a result of these approaches, the United States is now the world's leading incarcerator with an incarceration rate that is seven times the international average. The United States has some of the world's most severe punishments for crime, including for, ju for juveniles. Laws that expanded the definition of conspiracy to include individuals who are not directly involved in criminal acts, send many individuals to prison with life sentences. And research has revealed that the racial disparity uh, exists in mass incarceration. Blacks are incarcerated at rates five times that of whites in state prisons. Women continue to be the largest growing segment of incarcerated population, increasing at nearly double the rate of men since 1985. Black women now represent 30% of all incarcerated women in the United States, although they only represent 13% of the female population generally. This racial disparity in our criminal justice system is apparent in study after study. 
The origins of the disproportionate incarceration of the African-American community have deep roots in our national history. And so what are the solutions? Uh, this Congress, I will again introduce the Safe, Accountable, Fair, and Effective Justice Act, or Safe Justice Act, which takes a broad-based approach in implementing the federal sentencing and improving the federal sentencing and correction system from front-end sentencing reform to back-end release policies. Similar to uh, successful reform packages enacted in many states, the Safe, Safe Justice Act aligns federal prison system with the science about what works to reform our criminal justice system and reflects the growing consensus among researchers that tackling that, that tacking more months and years than the long prison terms is a high cost, low return approach to public safety. Legislation that focuses on the humanity and potential of incarcerated individuals rather than slogans and sound bites is essential. We also need conversations like the one we'll have today about the future of the criminal justice system. We have a very interesting panel uh, to talk to you today about some of the solutions we can begin to implement. Today's panel brings together scholars, experts, advocates, and policymakers working to change our broken system and improve outcomes. And I'm grateful to all of you for leading these conversations and working towards our shared goal of criminal justice reform. Thank you, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Congressman Scott. Now to introduce our panelists. We have with us today, Professor Rachel Barco. Professor Barco is Vice Dean and Charles Seligson Professor of Law and Faculty Director for the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at New York University School of Law. She is recognized as one of the leading experts on criminal law and policy in the country. She has served as a member of the United States Sentencing Commission and the Manhattan District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Panel. She received her JD from Harvard, magna cum laude, and has recently authored and published the book, Prisoners of Politics, Breaking the Cycle of Mass Incarceration. We also have with us today, Insha Rahman. Insha Rahman is Vice President for Advocacy and Partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice. She is a nationally recognized expert on bail and has developed bail legislation and policies, including recently passed reforms in New York State. Ms. Rahman served as part of a Blue Ribbon Commission, which developed a blueprint to close Rikers Island. She has been quoted as an expert on bail in the New York Times, NPR, and PBS. Prior to joining Vera, she was a public defender at the Bronx Defenders, and earned her JD from the City University of New York School of Law. We also have with us today, Ms. Kemba Smith Paradia. She went from college student to drug dealer's girlfriend to domestic violence victim to federal prisoner. In 1994, she was sentenced to 24 and a half years in federal prison as a first time nonviolent individual. Her case drew support from across the nation and in 2000, President Clinton commuted her sentence after serving time. She has worked with senior officials at the White House, the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, members of Congress, and has led trainings for federal and state probation organizations. Today, she is a wife, mother, advocate, and author of the book, Poster Child. In 2019, she was appointed to the Virginia Parole Board by Governor Ralph Northam. Prior to her appointment, she served on the Virginia Criminal Sentencing Commission and she held the position of State Advocacy Campaigns Director with the ACLU of Virginia. Along with being an advocate for criminal justice reform, Kemba is the founder of her own 501c3, the Kemba Smith Foundation. Ultimately, Kemba knows there is a lesson in each experience in life, and she has embraced her experience, learned from it, and is now using that experience to teach others. Also joining us today is Vanessa Martin. She is the director of the Reentry Division at the Los Angeles County Office of Diversion and Reentry. Under her direction, Los Angeles opened its first community reentry center, implemented a countywide intensive case management services program for and by those with lived experience of incarceration, and launched a sector based employment and training program. Over the course of her 23 year career, she has managed innovative large scale public policy projects with the goal of improving outcomes 
for people who have been impacted by generational poverty and mass incarceration. Ms. Martin's current work serves as a model partnership between county health and criminal justice departments and exemplifies what can be accomplished when policymakers create an infrastructure that is holistic and equitable. April Frazier Kamara is the Chief of Lifelong Learning at the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. She has extensive experience working at both the national and local level on justice reform efforts for alternative sentencing and reentry reform. Ms. Frazier Kamara has worked as a public defender and helped build the first ever holistic juvenile defense practice in Shelby County that employed both social workers and attorneys. She has conducted trainings and provided technical assistance to the American Bar Association, National Center for State Courts, and has guest lectured at George Washington University Law School, Howard University School of Law, and other academic institutions. She received her JD from Howard University. Thank you to all of our panelists. We're gonna start now with some words from Professor Rachel Barco. Thanks so much, Nina, um, for letting me be part of this amazing panel. It really is an honor to be with all of you today. Um, what I wanted to spend my time talking on is to um, carry forth some of the themes that Representative Scott has already raised. Um, and in particular, I just wanna highlight the ways in which our criminal justice policies don't make us safer. Because I think that's the big lie that any of us working on criminal justice reform really have to tackle. The public, if they think that you're passing some kind of new severe sentence and it's going to make them safer, they will support it. Um, they'll kind of support anything, frankly, um, that looks like it's going to make them safer. And that's the kind of political environment that I think we've been in now for decades. And that's how you end up uh, as the world's top incarcerator producing grotesque racial disparities, destroying families. You can ask yourself, how do you end up that way? And I think you end up that way because people are scared. Um, and if people are scared for their safety, they'll pretty much buy into anything, whatever the cost. So what I wanted to do is just highlight why it's not true that these policies make us safer. And in fact, they do just the opposite. And, and I think for any real criminal justice reform to work, one, we have to highlight why it's a, a bad policy idea to adopt these from a safety standpoint. Standpoint. But second, and just as importantly, we need institutional changes so we can have that rational conversation because it's just not enough to say it, to say, oh, that policy won't work. <laughs> People don't really believe it. I think we've all been part of those conversations. Um, so what you need are institutions in place that are insulated from that political environment so they can actually get good policies uh, accomplished um, without being part of that kind of emotional gut response to things. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of the ways in which um, we make bad policy decisions based on these emotional gut reactions. In law school, we, we have a expression, you know, um, bad facts make bad law. And that's pretty much all criminal law in America is. <laughs> you get bad facts, really awful cases um, that lead people to support some pretty awful laws. And we have no shortage of them uh, when it comes to criminal law in America. Um, so I'm just gonna start off with um, pretrial detention because I think that might be one that shows this in a, in a really stark way. So we have about half a million people in America who are there uh, pretrial. So they haven't been convicted of anything and yet they sit in cages. Um, and we do it because there is this assumption that that's somehow going to make us safer. We're locking them away. We're going to be safe. Um, but in fact, if you stop to think about it, most of those people who are detained pretrial, just like everyone we lock up, um, ultimately rejoin society. 95% of the people um, who are incarcerated come back out again. Um, and so the question is, when they come back out, how is that working for us when they reenter society? So if we think about the people pretrial who are detained, and you stop and you think for a minute, someone detained pretrial is probably going to lose their job because employers are not going to be super patient with the idea that they've been incarcerated. Incarcerated, um, you know, because they've been accused of a crime, um, they're going to lose their housing. They get evicted. They can't. They can't pay their rent. Um, if they're parents, they lose custody of their children. This is one of those life-altering experiences for someone, even if it's a short, a relatively short period of incarceration. So pre-trial detention destroys people's social fabric and their life. And when they do get out, think how hard it is for them 
to be on a law abiding path because we have just destroyed everything that they have known. And in fact, when we look at studies, what we find is pretrial detention leads to more crime for just that reason, for just that reason that it's unbended people's lives. Um, and it's true of sentencing more generally. When you put people in prisons for long periods of time, you make it that much harder when they get out to adjust successfully. So we have these counterproductive policies that people think make them safer, um, but in fact, they have just the opposite result. Um, and I could give you, you know, we'd need like a five hour seminar for me to go through the list of all the policies that are like this. Um, that is basically half my book um, is just a list of all of these policies that don't promote public safety. Um, and I think uh, if you look through them, they, they're all kind of obvious when you take that second look and ask yourself, oh, right, of course, when you put lots of collateral consequences on people with convictions and you make it impossible for them to get housing and student loans and occupational licenses and everything else we do, that's not helping public safety. And we just have tons and tons of examples of that. Um, so in the brief time I have, um, you have to trust me that there's lots of these. Um, the question is, what do we do about it? Um, and I think, you know, the kind of legislation that Representative Scott has mentioned um, is, is so important because it tries to kind of break that idea. There's some institutional reforms we could think about. Um, one of those institutional reforms that I think is important is this idea of insulating some of these decisions from the popular um, impulsive decision making process. So you can do that in a lot of different ways. One is you can have agencies set up. Um, I don't think the U.S. Sentencing Commission has been super successful. I was on it. <laughs> um, and I could tell you about some of the flaws, but for all its faults, it still was um, very good at reducing drug sentences. Um, and it was able to do it retroactively. Um, more than 30,000 people got their sentences reduced precisely because the Sentencing Commission has some insulation from the direct day-to-day -day politics. Um, it's been the biggest reduction we've seen in the federal prison population. And it's precisely because that agency is one step removed from Congress and other political actors. We could do that a lot. We could have other agencies that are a step removed. Um, we can have them um, and people like uh, like them who are not political direct political actors think about second looks for people's sentences. Um, the other thing I think that's really important is to make sure that prosecutors aren't in charge of everything. Um, you know, one of the reasons we have the world that we have in the United States is we tend to just defer to prosecutorial assessments of what needs to happen in terms of substantive legislation. Um, and so prosecutors are kind of in charge of all of it. Um, and one thing we could do is we could limit their authority over a variety of different things. You know, at the federal level, they're pretty much in charge of everything from clemency to correctional decisions, who gets out on compassionate release. Um, we don't have parole at the federal level, so there really is no second look. And so the only way you can get out after you've been given your sentence is if you get clemency or compassionate release, but you won't get that because the Department of Justice pretty much says no to everyone. So when we think about the kind of institutional changes, one of them is to make sure that prosecutors really have a more limited portfolio of things. Um, and then just the last thing I wanna highlight just to keep things brief um, is one of the reasons I think we ended up here is I think our courts have let us down. You know, I think a lot of this would be something that would be protected by constitutional guarantees if we had judges who were doing, frankly, a better job of protecting those things. And I think one reason that hasn't happened is because we really do have a bench dominated uh, by former prosecutors. Um, and one thing I've been really um, happy about in the current administration is we're seeing a lot of people appointed to the federal bench finally who have some criminal defense experience. They've done civil liberties work. Um, and I think it's really important because that includes a group of people then who have worked directly with individuals who have felt the brunt of these laws. They know what it's like. They have seen it. They've been close to it. They've been proximate. And I think people with that experience will do a better job on the bench um, enforcing some of these constitutional guarantees. And I think it's really important to have that to balance things out. So, so my takeaways really are to, you know, for sure, keep working at substantive changes, getting rid of mandatory minimums, reducing sentences and the like. Um, but to also really keep a close eye on some institutional shifts, taking some of that power away from prosecutors, thinking about how you get agencies in place that have some insulation and focusing on the courts, because I think all those places are going to be 
fundamentally important, not just to have change, but to keep it. Because I do think with every reform you successfully get passed, it's always vulnerable to the next crime wave, the next thing that scares the public. And before you know it, whatever gains you've achieved have been rolled back. Um, so I'll stop there uh, with another thank you again for letting me be part of this day. Professor Barkow, what a brilliant question to ask of any policymaker. Does this make us safer? Thank you for that insight on institutions as well, something I think that gets overlooked often. Next up, we have Insha Rahman with the Vera Institute of Justice. I echo the thanks for getting to be um, with all of you having this important conversation and to Representative Bobby Scott for leading the way on this issue as well as many others that are about racial justice and fairness in this country. So I started my career working in criminal legal reform and I call it legal reform as opposed to justice reform because I don't think our system yet has really earned uh, the title of justice, not for people who are accused or convicted of crimes and also not for victims and survivors who experience the system as unjust and unfair as well. So I've been working in this field for about 20 years and uh, have worked on pretrial justice bail reform for much of that time. And I wanna focus in on it because bail is really the front end of the system. After an arrest, people go in front of a judge and one of the very first decisions that's made that impacts the trajectory of the rest of the case is whether or not they are in jail pretrial or whether they get to go home to their communities, their families, and uh, have a chance at a fair defense. And I started my career as a public defender in the Bronx, which is one of the poorest congressional districts in the country, and where each and every one of the people I represented were black and brown. And the one thing that they all had in common is they didn't have money to pay for a lawyer, and so they got me. And we know already that the common thread was poverty and uh, access to resources. And yet I was in court each and every day where I watched judges set $250 bail, $500 bail on my clients, on the people I represented. And each time I saw that, I wondered to myself, is the judge setting $500 bail because they think that this person can make it and they intend for them to be released and fight their case from being home and in their communities? Or does the judge intend to actually keep this person locked up pre-trial? And that is among many other problems with money bail and our money bail system is the fundamental lack of transparency of what the decision intends when you see a judge set 250, 500, $1,000. And the average bail in this country on a felony case is upwards of $10,000. And we know from a study by the Federal Reserve that over 40% of Americans don't have $400 to cover an emergency. And so as Professor Barco said, we have close to half a million people who are in jail right now, presumed innocent, simply because they can't afford the price of their freedom. And in this country, we've had a money bail system basically since we've had a legal system. And I think we just assume, well, of course we need money bail. And what I think is so powerful about this moment where people are seeing the stories of how people are harmed when they can't afford bail and also how people benefit when they do get released, they get to go home to their families. I think what we are finally doing is asking ourselves the question of, do we need money as part of this system to make the right decisions about who should be released pretrial and who in the name of public safety do we have to detain? And we're at an exciting moment where I actually think we're seeing some examples of systems that release the vast majority of people who are arrested, because the truth is, if we are, uh, you know, looking for public safety, most people, even when accused of a crime, even a serious crime, in fact, can be home safely among us. And we can have solutions to address the underlying issues that led to this person's involvement in the criminal legal system that are not jail and incarceration. And so, in the money bail system, I would say that in this country, there have been three main drivers for perpetuating it. And these are the drivers that we need to address and uh, change in order to change our system. The first is this antiquated belief that people actually need a financial stake in their case to come back to court. Many of us believe, well, if I have $500 or $1,000 on the line, I will show up to court. Well, in Washington, D.C., that has basically eliminated money bail for the past three decades, uh, we found that people show up to court 88, 90 percent of the time, which is, in fact, more than people show up when people have to pay money bail to get out. 
What we've also seen again in places like New Jersey, New York, that have also either entirely or mostly eliminated money bail, we're seeing those high rates of return to court. And I think it's finally time to jettison this idea that people will only show up if their money is on the line, because the vast majority of people who are going through the criminal legal system don't have money to afford their freedom in the first place. And we've seen from places that have taken away money and just make a decision that you are released or you remain detained, people show up at the exact same rates. And as a public defender, I can tell you why. I represented thousands of people and each and every one of them recognized the seriousness of having to answer to a criminal charge and to show up to court. It's important to people. It changes their lives. They will show up because they have a stake that is much bigger than just money. The second driver is the bail bond industry. And I think it will surprise some people to know that we're one of two countries in this entire world that has a for-profit bail bond industry. The other one is the Philippines, and they don't use bail bonds nearly as much as we do. And for all of us, we've grown up with shows like Dog the Bounty Hunter. If you walk down to where the courts are on Main Street in whatever community, whatever town, whatever city you're in, you see the bail bond sign. And the truth is we don't need a bail bond industry where private people, agents are making a profit off of somebody's misery in order to secure a good and safe pretrial system. The bail bond industry uh, underwrites $14 billion of bail each year, and they make a profit of $2 billion. So what we've also seen is time and time again, when jurisdictions have tried to change their bail laws to get rid of money or the bail bond industry, we've actually seen the bail bond industry contribute to uh, politicians' races, to district attorneys' races, judges' races, so that they have the influence that they have historically had. There are a number of places that have basically eliminated the bail bond industry in this country. Um, and we have seen that nothing bad happens if, again, we take money and certainly the profit motive out of this system. It's time for the bail bond industry to go. And I actually think we are well on the way to seeing the perniciousness of allowing for an industry to turn a profit over uh, you know, a pretrial decision. And then the third barrier um, has been that until very recently, we haven't had good models in this country of how you can have a pretrial system not based on money, not driven by the bail bond industry. And in the past five years, we have started to see some really good examples beyond Washington, D.C. that eliminated money bail 30 years ago. And you know what? The sky didn't fall down. In New Jersey, um, five years ago, they passed a, a huge bail reform and speedy trial reform act. And what, they, what we've seen in the intervening five years is that the jail population has declined by 45%. Literally, there's close to half as many people in jail in New Jersey as a result of bail reform there. And importantly, crime has dropped in that time. Um, overall, arrests are down by almost one third, which is tremendous. And violent crime is down 18% in New Jersey during that same period of time. And so what we're learning there is you can incarcerate less and actually have more public safety. New York, which for many of you who follow the news got really bad headlines around bail reform. Um, there was serious backlash to it from politicians, from law enforcement, from district attorneys. But if you actually look at the facts and not the headlines, not the politics, you'll see that it's actually working as well. We've dropped the jail population in New York by about 30%. And every time we have looked to see what is driving this uptick, because there is a real uptick right now in shootings and homicides in New York City, as there are across many other cities in this country, when we've looked at the data, it is not people who are being released because of bail reform who are behind those numbers. So New York is actually another great example of where money bail um, is not used nearly as much as it used to. Um, we have decarcerated, had fewer people behind bars, and actually public safety is maintained because of it. And I would say another place to look to is Illinois that just passed a new bail reform law at the beginning of this year. Hasn't gone into effect yet, but it is actually one of the most far-reaching and exciting uh, pieces of legislation. So again, that's three places out of uh, 50 states, and we're finally starting to see the tide shift, and I really hope um, that we can continue in that direction. I believe we can. And I'll just end by underscoring what Professor Barco said, because I think it is so important. 
We do have this reptilian belief that criminal justice reform will make us less safe. There is a fascinating study that's shown that each and every year until very, very recently, and it coincided with the pandemic, but for two decades before, crime went down in this country. And each and every year that Americans were surveyed about crime, they said crime is going up. So our perception of public safety isn't actually based on data and facts and what's really happening. It's based on the headlines, the one or two outlier cases. And that can't be how we make criminal justice policy and criminal justice reform. So thank you again. I'm looking forward to this conversation and really appreciate the congressman for taking the lead on these important issues. Thank you so much, Ms. Rahman. That's such an insightful um, point about data and the link between money and safety and how it's a mirage in a lot of ways. I think that's such a, a wonderful um, project that you and your organization have engaged in that's really changing um, public safety in those states. Next up, we have an inspirational and wonderful speaker, Kemba Smith Paradia. Um, she's joining us, and so I'll turn it over to her. Thank you so very much. I'm very excited to be uh, a part of this esteemed panel and definitely excited to be a part of um, my congressman's uh, CBC event. Um, so first and foremost, I'm speaking from a personal perspective. And in doing that, um, I just wanted to say a quote from Michelle Obama, where she said, the difference between a broken community and a thriving one is the presence of women who are valued. And, and so for for, for my experience, um, never in a million years would I've thought that as a college student that I would have want, wound up going down the path that I've went on. But ultimately, as a first time nonviolent drug offender, I was sentenced to 24 and a half years in federal prison. And so um, there was a lot of um, support around my cause. But in backing up, just to give you a little snippet, ultimately, um, you know, I was excited about my college experience and got caught up in a relationship. That relationship turned abusive. Um, and next thing you know, you know, I was having to turn myself in to the authorities. And when I did turn myself in to the authorities, um, I was seven months pregnant. And so when we talk about this issue of, of pretrial, um, even though the government knew that I was no threat to public safety, ultimately, I wasn't granted a bond. And I was scared to death. I didn't know, you know what was going to happen. Um, the prosecutor that was handling my case um, said in court that I never handled, used, or sold any of the, of the drugs that were involved. But yet and still, I was not um, granted a bond. So I ended up giving birth um, to my son while I was incarcerated. And after giving birth to my son, um, I knew that eventually, well, immediately after giving birth to my son. I thank God for my parents. They are my um, heroes. I was very fortunate to have that support system, but my father went to the hospital prior to me giving birth because he wanted the administration to know that I was coming and wouldn't treat me in any old kind of way. And so because my dad did that, when I did give birth, um, the woman who was head of the hospital was there and she basically said that my parents could stay in the room next door because five minutes after I gave birth, the U.S. Marshal storm stormed into my hospital room and said that I couldn't have any visitors, that my leg had to be handcuffed and shackled to the bed at all times, and that I had to have two correctional officers guarding me. And so the woman who was head of the hospital basically spoke up to the U.S. Marshals and said, this is my hospital. I'm going to run it the way that I want to. And she allowed my parents to stay in the room next door. Had that not happened, my son would have automatically gone into the social service system um, after I went back into the, um, into the prison where I was being held. And so um, for me, also something that was very traumatic in to be a woman and to be a black woman, and here's some of the statistics that were said earlier, I didn't feel valued. Um, no one took into consideration um, of my background. And, you know, I, I have to be, you know, upfront in the fact that I feel like that even I was privileged through this situation because I did have the support of my parents and my parents were able to care for my son. But where do we live in a country where no one is a threat to public safety where you um, take away, forget about the, the woman who you know, is labeled the offender, but 
why would you punish the child as well? And so I know that um, in different states, there are uh, policies that have been put in place that give alternatives to incarceration, in particular to um, people that have children who are incarcerated. So I strongly advocate for that. That's something that I hold near and dear to my heart. But as a first time nonviolent drug offender, like I said before, the prosecutor said I never handled, used, or sold any of the drugs that were involved, but yet and still, I was still held accountable for 255 keys of crack cocaine. And so therefore, there still needs to be something done with this drug conspiracy law that can put someone behind bars for so long, which I would echo um, Professor Barkow and the fact that there needs to be agencies in place that do a second look. Um, I still have a friend who's incarcerated, Michelle West, and she's serving a double life sentence and she's been in prison over 27 years. And it's, it's, it's time. And for me, I had a sense of survivor's guilt once I was granted um, clemency. For those of you all who don't know, after I served my six and a half year sentence, there was a huge movement, uh, a, a small movement to help um, free me. And it wasn't just about me. It was about the fastest born population that was incarcerated at the time, like was mentioned, were Black women. And there were several organizations across the country that I don't, one I have to mention is the Legal Defense Fund because they took on my case pro bono. Um, but it, it, it was a wealth of um, women organizations that supported my release. So after coming out, it was really important for me to be a human face to this issue and advocate. And my years of being out of prison, I've been out of prison 20 years, things have changed drastically within this criminal justice system. Um, I'm proud to see so many other formerly incarcerated men and women who are bringing the perspective, like Professor Barkhouse said, um, in these spaces, in these rooms, hence, you know, I'm on a personal perspective, but I'm grateful that the governor of Virginia saw fit to appoint me to the um, Virginia uh, Parole Board. But um, there's still a ton of work to do, even when you talk about collateral consequences, even with my background coming out, I became a public speaker. It was really important for me to share my story also from the sense of um, preventing the uh, school to prison pipeline and to sh share with young people how it e easy it is to get caught in that system and to prevent that. But for me, um, it was just really important for me to continue to advocate um, for those that I left behind. And so in moving forward, I just know that um, we need to continue to look at humanity and look at the fact that these are human people. We are human people. And there needs to be a desperate change in the narrative. Um, and I know a lot of my formerly incarcerated colleagues would say the same thing because for the majority you know, I speak from a nonviolent, you know, drug offender perspective, but in my work and working with def different people um, in this space, um, they're mitigating circumstances that cause different people to get involved in different situations. And I just think that there needs to be an overall public education process. And I'm one that had it not been for sharing a story um, and sharing a narrative to help um, push for reform, reform to move people's hearts. Um, I still feel like that that's a strong avenue in um, pushing forth um, the values in the policy that needs to be pushed forth. Um, but there are several things that um, I would like to mention also in the fact that um, the domestic violence piece um, and women in incarceration and the trauma that women endure um, even though I had two expert witnesses that spoke about um, the domestic violence and abuse, my 80 year, 89 year old judge didn't take anything in consideration. He basically said that he wanted to use me as a deterrent to others. And so I guess where in a sense can there be a social work perspective brought in in that second look process that can help people understand some of these mitigating circumstances. So um, for me, you know, I'll just kind of stop right there. But, um, you know, I'm grateful for the progress of where we've come. Um, I've had the opportunity to, you know, be 
you know, in the, it's bipartisan in the Obama White House and in um, the Trump White House. And I just hope that in a bipartisan way that we can continue to move this discussion um, because there's still hundreds of others that deserve the opportunity to see opportunity for freedom as well. And to ensure that they're the correct, that there's enough resources. Because one of the things, and I won't go tiptoe in anybody else's um, subject matter, but there's there's just simply not enough resources for people coming out of incarceration. And you know, with someone on the line from California, one of my sisters, um, Susan Burton, um, who has a, a, a safe house um, organization there, um, she provides a good blueprint for anyone who may be interested in opening up a home for um, people coming out of prison. Um, so like I said, it's just really important when we talk about these issues. And again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of the conversation that you have people who are impacted that are part of this conversation as well. Thank you so much. Um, Kemba Smith Paradia. She is a tireless advocate, has not forgotten anyone who's still in custody, um, emphasizing once again the importance, um, which has been a theme, of second look and what that means in our criminal justice system. And, um, you know, thank you for your work and your voice. Um, up next, we have someone who's discussing some of those re-entry uh, policies and a policymaker herself. Um, Vanessa Martin is joining us from the West Coast, and I'll turn it over to her. Great. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, yes, good afternoon. It's now afternoon on my, my coast. Um, uh, I really want to start out by thanking, um, as everyone else has, uh, thank you, Congressman Scott um, and Nina, uh, particularly for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion. Um, and really kudos to you for putting together a panel of all women. Um, this is an extremely impressive group. Um, I'm really uh, I can't state enough how truly honored I am to be here and humbled to be presenting alongside such esteemed activists and academics. Um, uh, Kemba, your story is extremely powerful. I appreciate you so much for sharing it. Um, Insha, I, I, I was immediately impressed with you when I saw you at an alternative to incarceration meeting um, in LA County and uh, Professor Barkow, I've been following your work for a long time. So um, really, really honored to be here. Um, with all of you. Um, and I do want to just also echo, you know, that we are all very much celebrate the progress that has been made, um, but that there is still so much work to be done um, and so much hate, um, harm to be repairing. Um, and, you know, while we're making some steps in those directions, um, I believe that real, real significant reform needs to happen um, in, order, um, in order for us to really make the progress that we need to make um, to create an equitable society. Um, so I'm going to start out by just highlighting our three key initiatives in LA County, as well as a new program for women in reentry that is currently in development. Um, as maybe many of you probably know this, uh, in California, there has been significant legislation in recent years to reform the criminal legal system and reduce reliance on incarceration. Um, the savings from reforms such as Proposition 47 uh, and Senate Bill 678 um, has enabled us at the Office of Diversion and Reentry to begin to meet the wide ranging needs of the reentry population in LA County. As of this June, we have served over 28,000 people. And this is just in our reentry division at ODR um, across more than 50 community-based organizations and through partnerships with dozens of county agencies. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how critical it is um, to be working alongside community-based organizations who've been doing this work for decades without dedicated uh, government funding um, and with partnerships with our uh, county agencies. Um, so really wanna lift up that point. Um, for context, there are 35,000 people on adult felony probation alone in LA County, plus thousands leaving our county jails as well as state prisons. Um, at the Office of Diversion Reentry, we launched our first program um, in April, 2018, our first reentry program called the Reentry Intensive Case Management Services Program, or RICMS for short. Uh, you bear with me as I go through many, many acronyms during my presentation. Uh, RICMS is led by community health workers who, who are people with lived experience of incarceration or what many people refer to as credible messengers. Um, this makes a huge difference because community health workers serve as advocates for their clients and have a whatever it takes approach to assisting them with their needs, ranging from accompanying them to doctor's appointments, to helping them acquire IDs, to navigating what we all know is the complex housing, employment, and social services systems. 
RACMS has now grown to a countywide program with 29 providers and 105 community health workers. Uh, we're very, very extremely proud of this program and has served over 19,000 people returning home from the county jails and state prisons for on, or on parole or probation. So our reach is, is, very, is very broad um, and our uh, general population we're serving um, is quite, quite, um, well, quite wide. Um, so providing RACMS costs literally 50 times less per day than it does to keep that person in jail. Um, it provides community health workers with a meaningful job where their experience of the pain as we've discussed becomes expertise to support others struggling to reintegrate and heal. So I wanna take this as an opportunity to share a quote from one of the members of my team um, who was incarcerated in state prison. Um, he is uh, you know, beyond an amazing human being in everything he's overcome. And before joining the Office of Diversion and Reentry, he was a, a RICMS community health worker. Um, and he said, 11 years ago, I reentered society. Fortunately, I have family support to help minimize the stress of reintegration. Most justice involved folks do not. RICMS is the vehicle that will help the individual to become whole again. So one of the most important collaborations we have is with the probation department, and that's on LA County's first community reentry center called DOORS, which stands for Developing Opportunities and Offering Reentry Solutions. Uh, DOORS provides an array of comprehensive supportive services and a warm, welcoming, and culturally responsive environment. Uh, it's in essence a one-stop shop uh, where services are provided by both community and county partners. Um, community partners offer employment and education, education services, including vocational training, transitional employment opportunities, and GED classes. We offer placement into interim housing and linkage to permanent housing. We also offer legal services and family reunification support. Our county providers offer mental health and substance use services and access to public benefits. <clears throat> One of our community pro pro uh, providers who's already gotten a shout out, so happy to shout her out again, is a new way of life reentry project founded by Susan Burton. Uh, the organization provides safe housing for women returning home and helps women reconnect with their children and other family members. As Ms. Burton would say, um, having a buffet of easily accessible services is essential to meet the complex needs of women returning home. Um, and uh, as since we launched and opened the center on July 1st of 2019, so just a little over two years ago, we have served over 2,500 people. The last program I wanted to highlight today is our new employment and training program called SECTOR, also as an acronym. Uh, not only has research shown uh, that uh, employment can be an important factor in reducing recidivism, but we have also heard directly from people with lived experience of incarceration that employment assistance is a top need for fully integrating into society. This January, we launched the Skills and Experience for the Careers of Tomorrow, or SECTOR for short, to provide vocational skills training in Los Angeles County's high growth sectors that offer career pathways with family sustaining wages to individuals with justice involvement. Um, and really key for us was to really think creatively and innovatively in all the programming that we do, but particularly with this program to really think outside the box um, in, the, in the sectors that we wanted to target. Um, because you know, historically there have been you know, certain sectors where most people with justice involvement can only get jobs um, but we really wanted to, to broaden that thinking and think about, you know, there's no reason why individual, individuals with, with um, system involvement um, aren't able to take advantage of all these other burgeoning sectors within uh, LA County, particularly um, in, in uh, information technology and IT. Uh, the program is delivered through six community-based organizations, which is the through line to all of our programming. Um, everyone, all of our programs are delivered by community-based organizations. Um, for the sector programs, there's uh, organizations that specifically specialize in uh, workforce development services for the reentry population and provide or partner with organizations that provide training in high growth sectors. Uh, the goal of the program is to serve 500 participants per year. Um, and as of June, I'm very proud to uh, announce that we have uh, already uh, sur surpassed our goal and have served 360 participants and placed 67 people in jobs. Um, so while I have a very small and mighty team at the Office of Diversion, we're less than 10 people in my, in my division um, and very proud of the work that we've developed. We are, only, we are in a uh, quite tenuous position at this time as we don't have stable and sustained pro, uh, funding for our programs. Um, we are only scratching the surface and need to be able to expand these key initiatives for ICMS, FORS, and sector. 
Um, and while we are uh, also very excited about a new program for women that is currently in, develop, in development um, and for which we are again, currently seeking funding. Um, as Congressman Scott noted, the rate of incarceration for women is disturbingly high and continues to grow. Uh, justice involved women have higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder and are 10 times more likely to use substances to respond in response to trauma. So in response to this growing need um, for women, um, services for women, we are developing the Providing Opportunities for Women in Reentry Program, or POWER for short. Uh, and POWER will aim to reduce recidivism by promoting, promoting healthy connections with children, family and significant others and the community, comprehensively addressing substance use, trauma and mental illness, increasing economic well-being through education, employment and housing support. And our goal is to launch power in early 20, 2022 um, contingent on funding. So in closing, um, I would be also be remiss to, if I didn't take this opportunity uh, with you, Congressman Scott, uh, the chair of the Committee on Education and Labor, to emphasize the need to, pair, to pass fair chance hiring legislation on the federal level, similar to California's Fair Chance Act that prohibits employers with five or more employees to ask about an applicant's criminal record before making a job offer. So I want to definitely make a plug for that. And uh, really just in closing, um, and thank you for the time check. Uh, thank you again, uh, Congressman Scott and Nina for this opportunity um, and for your leadership and career long commitment to improving the lives of those impacted by incarceration. Um, and I want to invite uh, all of you, um, everyone on this panel um, and anyone who will be future listening to this. Um, as soon as our physical doors reopen, I want you to invite you all to visit us in Los Angeles County so you can see the transportation that's taking place. So thank you so much again, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ms. Martin. I think for any policymaker listening out there, hearing what you've done under the umbrella of Los Angeles's health department, um, and the work you've done in the criminal justice space, that's a model that's really new and exciting out there. Well, closing out this discussion um, very strongly is someone who is a lifelong advocate and an amazing speaker. Um, I've heard her speak many times. April Fraser Camara is joining us and she has a lot to share. So I will leave the floor to her. Thank you so much, Nina. Uh, first of all, I just wanna echo, it is indeed a pleasure to share this space today with amazing women to talk about this important issue. Kemba, I don't know if you remember me, but I am a student of Howard Law School who was inspired by your story when I was in college. And so the perspective that I bring today in my remarks is one from a perspective of being a black public defender, who has worked my entire career to center the issue of race equity and holistic defense. So one title, Nina, that uh, was excluded from my bio was the fact that I'm the founder and chair of the Black Public Defender Association. And so today I'm going to share the perspective through a race equity lens um, around the issue of holistic defense and in the role that public defenders can play in dismantling carceral systems. Systems. I would like to I would like to start out by first explaining the lens through which the Black Public Defender Association has really looked at the issue of incar mass incarceration, and we really examine these issues from a carceral systems lens. And what does that mean? Carceral systems are defined as a comprehensive network of systems that rely, at least in part, on the exercise of state-sanctioned physical, emotional, spatial, economic, and political violence to preserve the interest of the state. And so the lens of carceral systems really allow us to look at the various systems that work together to produce the racial disparities that we see in society today. So we start with a look at the juvenile dependency system um, and then to connect that to juvenile delinquency. And from there, education is very much interwoven along with the issue of immigration incarceration, reentry, and housing. So today, the focus of my discussion is going to focus on those seven systems and specifically recommendations of how we can disrupt those systems in order to address racial inequities. 
So I want to talk about uh, the disparate harm. So as we talk about these issues, it's very important to talk about what communities are disproportionately targeted and funneled into carceral systems. And so I really wanna share with uh, you all today this concept around the criminalization of blackness and the devastating impact that it has had on generations of um, people of color. And when we heard Kimba's story about um, her experience of giving birth while incarcerated and how she was treated as a human, it very much invokes to me uh, feelings related to the history of slavery in America. And so I think it's very important for us to connect together when we talk about systems, this, the, the, this reoccurring concept of criminalization of Blackness that you see reoccurring in various carceral systems that work together to cause harm to communities of color. So you will be able to see that Black people in the U.S. are disproportionately surveilled, arrested, and funneled into carceral systems. Black children, we'll even talk about immigration, Black immigrants, um, but also Black adults. And so we just continue to see this disparate harm, um, and it all is so very well connected to this concept of criminalization of Blackness. So I want to focus um, today at some of the statistics that you will be able to find in the report that was issued by the Black Public Defender Association entitled uh, Disrupting Carceral Systems. And it was a set of recommendations to the Biden-Harris administration around what approaches could be taken to disrupt the harm. As we start out, um, and I actually will start out with juvenile de dependency. This fact to me is so startling, the fact that one in three children um, will be the subject of ch child maltreatment investigations. But for Black children, over 50% of them will be subject to an investigation before they turn 18 in the juvenile dependency system. And we, can, and we continue to see this play out while many of those families who initially come in contact with the legal system through family courts, oftentimes those same families end up in the juvenile delinquency system. While Black children only make up 14% of the youth, youth population, they make up 32% of children who are arrested in the juvenile delinquency system. And the incarceration rates and transfer to adult court is even more troubling. 42% of um, Black children are, 42% of the children who are in juvenile delinquency confinement are Black. Um, and 52% of, of children who are transferred to adult court from juvenile court are African American, despite the fact that we only make up 12 to 15% of the population. And another system that oftentimes when we talk about um, the criminal legal system, we don't oftentimes talk about immigration. And I wanted to share with you all the fact that we found in our report that 76% of deported uh, black immigrants are removed on criminal grounds versus 45% of the general population of people who find themselves before immigration court. And again, we see an uh, underlying issue around disproportionality, even in our immigration system um, with removal processes as well. And many of you, um, I don't think I have to um, go over incarceration rates. I have experts on the panel who um, we all know the disproportionality of uh, people of color being represented in our um, prison systems and jails across America. And we continue to see uh, that play out in incarceration numbers. 
And specifically, when we talk about reentry, the percentage of Americans, um, the U.S. adult population who have a felony conviction, um, the rate, um, and this is from 2010, and we may even see a greater uh, disparity now, 23% compared to 6% of the population. So disproportionately, we continue to see um, people of color, specifically Black Americans, uh, be disproportionately impacted by um, not just the criminal legal system, but the myriad of systems that even once you finish uh, serving your sentence, as Kimba and other people talked about, this notion of a felony conviction, how it disrupts your ability to move on with your life and is, is really a lifelong punishment. So I really would like to, um, while we talked about the issues and probably reminded many of you in the audience, the numbers that I shared with you uh, may not be a surprise to you. Perhaps you haven't been able to look at it through a comprehensive carceral systems lens, but the racial disparities in America is not a surprise to many of us. And so I really want to focus now about how do we disrupt those carceral systems, because the disruption of those systems are a critical part to advancing race equity in America. So I will share with you a phrase around, there can be no criminal legal reform without race equity. So I would really like to um, emphasize the idea of, as we talk about reforms and best practices and programs that's working in America to reduce mass incarceration, we should also ask ourselves whether or not it's disrupting racial inequities. And so I'll um, finish and conclude my remarks with three recommendations from the Black Public Defenders Report on Disrupting Carceral Systems which really focused on um, three areas. The first is this concept around surveillance. I really want to highlight that a common theme that we saw in looking at disproportionality and disparate impact on Black communities is that this idea that Black communities are surveilled but not supported. And if we're able to disrupt that cycle where support for Black communities is the top priority versus surveillance, it would go a long way for us to be able to disrupt um, harm that is happening in those communities. Also, there's a number of recommendations, and I'm not going to get into them, but topics like second look and uh, racial impact statements. Um, were also recommended in the report, but it's so important to talk about not only correcting, but also reversing the carceral policies that have disproportionately harmed Black communities. So again, a focus on not just whether or not the criminal legal reform is going to reduce the number of people that's incarcerated, but is it going to reduce racial disparities? Um, and, and finally, we feel very strongly we're at a moment in these conversations around criminal legal reform for us to really have a serious conversation about redirecting funding back to communities that are disproportionately impacted. So I'm excited to hear about programs in L.A. ran by Susan Burden and other people who are disproportionately who are directly impacted because the notion that these problems can be solved without the black and brown communities that have been dis disproportionately impacted is, um, I think it is, it's not sustainable and it's not um, best practices. So really to focus on redirecting funding, funding back to black communities. So I am going to uh, stop there. Um, but I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide my perspective as a Black defender and to bring together the lens of race, equity, and holistic defense, because I would encourage all of us not to just stop at um, reforms that reduce 
jail populations and incarceration. But if we're not doing um, anything to reverse the disproportionate harm that has been levied against Black communities, then I think we're um, not seeking true justice. So Representative Bobby Scott, it's been a pleasure. And um, I'll turn it back over to you all. Well, thank you, thank you very much. We promised that there'd be scholars, experts, advocates, and policymakers. That's what we got. I wanna thank all the panelists. I wanna thank uh, Nina Patel for organizing and the CBCF for another annual uh, legislative conference in spite of the pandemic. And for one closing uh, comment, um, uh, Kemba's asked to uh, make one little closing uh, comment, but we wanna thank everybody for, for coming. Kemba, you're gonna close us out. Yes, um, and Congressman Scott, we as a panel tremendously thank you. And you know, I have a personal thank you that I didn't get to say in the beginning, but Congressman Scott, you have been a champion on this issue for decades. And um, I remember you pushing my legal team to hurry up and get you know, my commutation paperwork in. And I know that um, you've helped people value um, my voice and story immediately coming out. So I just really wanted to thank you as a whole for your com continued commitment and whatever we can do um, to continue to push forth your agenda and to bring us to a to continue to move forward because there's still a whole lot of work to do and you know far better than we do. Um, so thank you so much for your support, Congressman Scott. We really appreciate you. And thank you. And with that, uh, this concludes the uh, forum. And thank you very much to all of our panelists for being with us. 